happy to. So One second, I just realized I can't latch S SPL down here. Uh, so this view here, I, if, you, if you look at the sat feed three, this is the 3D view. This is probably the easiest one to understand. This is really just a 3D representation of what's going on in the data that we collected. So if we zoom in here, whoops. If we zoom in here, you can see Hercules, which is 30 meters above the seafloor about. This big fan here that you see is the multi-beam swath. So this is like basically the raw data coming out of the multi-beam. So areas of higher intensity show in more red. And you can kind of see these red areas here. We can see a reflection of the seafloor. Yep. Right? Uh, there's an algorithm that goes through, automatically picks out the bottom detections using both uh, phase and um, intensity information. And it picks out this white line here. That's the last ping that we received. So that white line right there is the last ping we received. These yellow points here are the last minute and a half of, uh, or uh, last two minutes of points that we received. So they just are raw. And you can see them there as we zoom in. So you can see little rocks and little features in there. Uh, and they're colored by backscatter, right? So the darker that they are, basically you can think that's the louder the echo that we're receiving. Okay. So we send a pulse and how loud the echo is corresponds to the, corresponds to the color that we're seeing. Chris, what's the, the I, you talked about the bottom detections, not being that kind of linear line, but what is the arc, you know, the black space, and then you have uh, where it turns into blue uh, in the three-dimensional Yeah, view? so. What, what's all that? The three-dimensional view is a, uh, because it's, all these individual points are very difficult to um, keep in computer memory and display for the entire survey. So we actually turn those points into a world model. So this rainbow color here basically represents the shape of the seafloor. Uh, purple colors, uh, purple and blue colors are deeper, red colors are shallower. But if we look in, you can actually just see, it's just like a, it's a little mesh. Okay. Right? And you can see little features and ridges and, and things like that in there. Yeah, so that's basically the best representation of the seafloor that we have in real time. We can do a little better with some post-processing. We can see little rocks and ridges, and we haven't seen anything crazy in here yet. Chris, how about the, on the other end of your survey, down where it's purple, the deeper section, you, and you're seeing kind of the acoustics coming out of Herc? Uh, yeah. What is that, the, the black? Okay, so, oh, yeah, so and all that? What? the black sections are sections that the sonar couldn't see. So you can kind of imagine the sonar like a flashlight. Okay. And if you shine the flashlight over um, over a cube, for example, sitting on the seafloor, it'll only light up a couple faces of that cube. The backsides will be black, right? They'll be in the darkness. That's pretty much the same thing that we're seeing here. So the technical term for that is called an, occlu is called an occlusion, right? So those are pl places that the sonar just can't see. So you can imagine if we look at it kind of from this view, as Hercules comes over here, and there was a there was a rock here, this back side of it wasn't lit up, and it wasn't okay. insonified. It wasn't seen by the sound, right? Yeah. So that's why we're seeing these tears. Um, and once we get farther out, the data density just isn't just isn't enough to uh, What's fill the some holes. Swath width? How far can you see out each side? Yeah. So if we look right. over here, we can actually measure the swath width. So it looks like there's uh, about a 118 meters to starboard and 140 meters to port. So about 250 meters, something like that. Yeah. So that's like gives us a lot more range than we yeah than we can see. We can only see about a couple meters, right? So if we look on our world model here, uh, we can only see maybe down to about where my cursor would be, about that range. Yeah. Right? Or if we were going to look in this view, we can only see about this far clearly.
Chris, I appreciate your. So the last, maybe the last image that we've got hey, up. One second. Uh, I'm gonna yeah, quick, go uh, quick ops thing. Uh, are, did we make a turn, yes. guys? Okay. I just, I just, I guess you didn't pick up on that. No, I had to yeah, turn. I changed. had to turn you guys off while I was talking on SPL. Okay, so we're we're holding position right now, and I changed heading, so we're going zero five zero now. Roger. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, a little dogleg in the track here. Yeah. It's okay. So, so here's it. So here's a good example of an occlusion. Where to go? Okay. Right here, you can see the front face of this rock. It may be a little hard to see in the sat feed. The compression might kind of kill you guys. But you can see that the front side of this face is relatively bright. Yep. Because there was a nice flat surface, right? So it got um, it returned a good echo, and the area behind it was shad uh, was shadowed. And that's actually so. That's actually something that we can use to find very small features on the seafloor, right? So when we look at the acoustic backscatter, we can we can uh, see that. Well, I'm going to try and step so, over, actually. Hey, video, is this something we can get out on Sapphead 1 so it's less compressed? No, okay, um, so the I last thing that we're seeing over here, here... Yeah, yeah, what's the lower... lower this left? is yeah. called... This is the side scan view. So this is all about backscatter. So this is not a good time to be talking about it because it's going to look wacky because we're maneuvering. Here. Yeah, that's right. I, we can I can at least go <laughs> over it. You can see a couple things. So this is just the intensity. So if you, if you imagine taking this white line and just looking at the backscatter values all the way across the entire line, that's what we're seeing here. Okay. So if further out we go from the center, uh, the brighter. Or yeah, the further out we go from the center, the you know, farther away we are from Hercules. Why isn't there any data in the center? Why has it got like a left and a right? So, okay, that's 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 getting to be a little more technical of an issue. Uh, so, directly below us, we basically don't get very good backscatter information. Um, it basically just you you kind of have to look out to the side so that you can actually see those shadows and see those differences in uh, bathymetry. Because if you look straight down, if you look straight down on a, a rock on the seafloor, yeah. right, the backscatter of the rock and the seafloor are basically going to look the same. Okay. Um, the multi-beam can, can actually handle that and give you backscatter on those kind of views. Uh, is this the nadir? But, the yeah, this is, nadir yeah this is the nadir. And yeah. so that's left over from sort of the side scan days. Okay. Uh, and this is trying to emulate a side scan view. Uh, side scans don't look directly down because they don't How get good go? backscatter. Yeah, cool. Um, but the multi-beam actually does, and as you can see in this view, we actually do get we actually do get backscatter in the middle. But you, if you notice, like most of the interesting features that we see in the backscatter, let me turn off the the map. Uh, now that we're going back over, most of the most of the interesting features that we see in the backscatter are actually out here. Right, so you can see a little rock there, a little rock there, that sort of thing. If you look in the middle, it's just kind of bright and blown out. The feature has to be very pronounced in the center to show up uh, in the okay. backscatter. All right. I appreciate, Chris, you taking the time. I know you're busy tuning this system to get the best survey for us. Yes, thank you so much. Your explanations are very helpful um, to those with visually impaired, giving them uh, an idea of exactly what it is that we're seeing and eventually Hopefully, we'll be able to get some examples and some models out so that is something yep. that can be uh, shared and, and explored. Yeah, happy to. Anytime you have questions, I'm down here. Thank you. So if we were trying to get a, a general mental image for someone who does struggle with a visual impairment, and they're asking, should they expect to see small bumps, large bumps, um, scattered out or all clumped together. And I would venture yeah. to say it's a little bit of all of those things, just depending yeah, on the I, location where we're at. That's kind of actually, I mean, that's what we're here trying to determine, right? Right. The This is a tool that's very useful to sort of classify what the bottom looks like on a, you know, hundreds of meter length scale. So we can see, are there large, are there, are there large bumps? Are there small bumps? Are there cliffs? Are there valleys? Those are all the types of things that we're looking for. Chris. And so far, it looks like it's a relatively flat surface. Uh, it's uh, it's on a big slope. 
uh, and there's a lot of very small features and a couple large boulders. Perfect. Good deal. Yeah. What, Chris, what's the resolution of the the map that you'll be able to make from this? So how, you know, what size rock could we resolve um, um, or see? At this altitude, I would say that we could we could easily resolve a half meter or a meter size rock. Okay, so uh, we like could basketball. If, if, is that yeah, like, yeah, I think basketball is probably about the smallest that we could easily resolve. If we start playing games and looking very closely at the data and looking at backscatter and things like that, we could get smaller than that. Maybe, maybe tennis ball size. That's probably pushing it, but yeah. 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 Now that you've turned, we've turned, and now you're kind of getting overlap of the backscatter, does that do anything to the data that you're collecting? Is it better or worse? Um, in an ideal world, it should be better. Uh, <laughs> but it really depends on how good our navigation is through this. So it depends on how well our DVL, Doppler velocity log, is working. That basically tracks our, you can think of it like a two-dimensional odometer in your car, right? It reads off how many miles you went. This one reads off how many miles you went forward and how many miles you went left and right, right? And you kind of add those up over time and keep track of your position. Uh, and if it has a good bottom lock, it's very accurate. If, we, if it drops out periodically, um, there can be discontinuities of that. And you'll miss, you'll miss miles, right? Uh -huh. So when you finally go to add up your total value, you're not where you thought you were. Right. Uh, and we have various ways to deal with that. Um, can you fill in some things that you missed on sort of a first pass at a different angle? Yes, you can. And that's a common thing to do, yeah. Uh, but you'll often find that when you come from a different angle, the map won't be quite aligned because that odometer is not perfect. Right. So that's when we have to do something. Um, we have to find a way to re-register the maps. Mm -hmm. So that can either be done manually or that can be done through a process called uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. Right? And that's what... Uh, that's sort of the dream. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, slam. We're working at that, but uh, we haven't quite have, we don't have it quite implemented on Hercules yet. Uh, but we do, I do manually uh, register the maps from pass to pass and get pretty good results with that. But yeah, ideally you want that to be automatic and to happen at a very high rate, mm -hmm. right? So it's constantly, not only is it looking at how it's tracked across the seafloor, but it's also looking for landmarks. Right? It's like, oh, I've seen that rock before, and it's yeah. like, I must have, I must have lost two meters along my track, and it like, it readjusts and back propagates through the whole thing. That's the dream. Yeah, it's really powerful. Um, but that's, uh, yep, that's a bit of a research project that we like just haven't gone down yet. A 15-minute masterclass. In, like, <laughs> like this has been great. I even just a ref as you talked through it, uh, a refresher for me was like really helpful. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, anytime. Don't get me started on mapping. I'll, I'll just go on. <laughs> I'm sure the chat's going to be loaded with questions now, so we'll. Uh, yeah, we'll so we've got little way. echoes, large echoes, those small echoes, all of them coming together to just give us that ideal shape of what it is that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not even seeing. In fact, in satellite feed one, you're looking from uh, Hercules, we're still. Uh, have that solid um, solid depth, not a lot going on. It's just a very... Um, yeah, we're about 30 meters off the seafloor, so we're not... It's beyond the kind of camera range yeah. and the range of the lights. And then as you look uh, from satellite two, as we're looking from at Atlantis down at Hercules, um, because of the lighting, we're able to see a lot of the detritus. And I say that, and look what comes to um, number one at this time. There's a shrimp that just kind of floats by, just random flybys. Um, but in satellite two, you got a lot of the detritus and a marine snow that we see uh, a lot of little light and white particles that uh, we're just kind of flowing through that are hitting the camera lenses and just jumping off and um, we can see uh, a really good aerial view of Hercules from the top, which is kind of always keeping our eye on, on Herc through. So can we use this technology to go ahead Talking and check me. for biofueling on the yeah, ship? Yeah, we have. Uh, can we use this technology to check for biofouling on yes. the ship? On the ship hull? Um, kilohertz. Cameras, for sure, right? Yeah. Because it's near the surface, so it's well lit, and we can 
we could see that. What's the Sea King at? Could we you use, want me to turn it off? Uh, so for our other viewers, pause for a moment. What is biofouling? Uh, so uh, anything that's floating yeah, in the, kill the uh, ocean. Sea King There's all kind. Off. Kristen, maybe you can help me here too. Yeah, but biofouling is usually something where you get like a yeah. coating on a ship or on anything that lives in the ocean for a little while. So like ships uh, are. You might be a, actually. You might be picking issue up with the altimeter Navy ships, from, the biofouling. Um, so yeah. things start to grow and they Atlanta. slows down the ships and it can cause other uh, issues. Because um, it's, it's actually right equipment above Equipment and, so. and also ships and, and that sort of thing. So And it's usually so, okay, like yeah, a film. Yeah, there are organisms off. that start to grow. You can get things like barnacles at once you get like really advanced biofouling, but even just like a film of uh, microbes growing on uh, ships can, can So could things. we see it acoustically if we if we tried to image the hull of the ship? So I, and Chris might have an opinion here. If the organisms are mostly filled with water, maybe not, you know, but uh -huh. the barnacles and those sorts of things, if we were really, uh, weren't doing our our proper maintenance and, and letting the hull of the ship go. Here in Hawaii, the, we've got to have the hull inspected coming and going out of the Papahanaumokuakea Kea, just so that we're not attracting any invasive species in right. and out. So uh, Nautilus uh, shouldn't have that much biofouling uh, on the hull, and that the big impact there is fuel consumption on these voyages. The cleaner the hull, the less fuel we use. Now, only if there was a biofouling that like reduced fuel consumption, some sort of like turbocharged biofouling, yeah, maybe like we could Teflon for the outside yeah, of the ship. We could be supportive of this <laughs> yeah. instead of scraping it off. We'd have right. like a yeah, we could maybe that's a whole thing. Another O and R initiative right yeah. there. Look at this two yeah, in the one watch. Uh -huh. <laughs> Temperature. Chris, are you still with us? So I have someone that wants to know about, um, with the landscaping view of this sonar, if you were to come across very large organisms, how does that affect the overall visual of the sonar mapping? Does that end up giving him issues when so it comes to building the, the image? Uh, a bit, but the, Chris mentioned the bottom detection algorithm that's running that's that's designating which pings kind of represent the bottom. There's uh, also a water column view where you can you can associate things if the sonar does see things in the water column, much like a fish finder, you know. Okay. Um, and oh yeah, here he goes. He's gonna. He's gonna show us. And so if we did go over, say, a large school of fish, or there was some sort of biology between us and the seabed. You could see that anomaly in the in the water column, and uh, if you're watching satellite uh, feed three, he's showing us that that imagery. Yeah, I don't know, Chris, if you want to expand on that or the like sensitivity. Sorry, I, I was having a I catch me up. I was uh, just we were, got out of a conversation with Bob. Yeah, we were talking about the uh, if there was a say a school of fish that swam between. Herc and the seabed, would we see any change in the map or could Norbit detect the fish? So Norbit's pretty good. It expects uh, it expects sort of the bottom detection to be sort of in a line and it'll figure out if something is in the water column. Now if something very, very bright comes through and creates a big enough return, it will detect that. But that being said, if a fish or methane seeps was something that we did in the past, so like looking for gas bubbles in the water column, that is definitely something that would show up in the water column. The methane seeps are really cool because like if you look here in the water column view, yeah, you could see like a stream of bubbles coming up and you can see it sort of fade in and fade out as we drive over it, right? So if we saw, f if it was going to say resonate on a large school of fish, it would be like the air bladders in the fish that would be the, what would... Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it can. It's a high enough frequency that it can actually pick up, pick up their bodies. Um, but yeah, the air bladders are. They basically ring like a bell when you hit them with an acoustic pulse. So they, you can really see them clearly. So interesting. Technology. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. The question is, do they look like? Do they look like fish then when you see them on the? <laughs> I mean, it, define fish. Does, yeah. does a blob does a blob count? Yeah. <laughs> no. 
So we talked about the styrofoam cups and the popcorn and whether or not we could get a pumpkin down, but someone's asking about if we ever thought about taking bubble wrap down. Oh. It's bubble wrap. <laughs> Do you know about how long the survey will continue for? Uh, we have about 100 more meters um, left in our track, so at our speed, that would probably be... I can uh, see Johan calculating, calculating, yeah, calculating, <laughs> calculating. <laughs> oh, Yo Johan actually has a physical calculator there. Awesome. <laughs> you know, what? something that's kind of interesting that I had just learned about was uh, some recovery places that they'll take them. I'll like be right back and run down to the data lab real quick take to make sure they're still floats and take it down and it shrinks down to nothing you know it gets really small yeah but then they release the thing and, and as it comes up that expands back out again you know, and provides the flotation so yeah we had uh i was I, as <laughs> I served in the navy i was in the diving community and we would do like s underwater salvage work with lift bags right it was kind of this uh it was a sack you mm -hmm. know that yeah. would you take down to the bottom and then you'd use your tanks or if you were in like surface applied kind of diving you'd use that as the air source and you fill get, this thing up what? to provide buoyancy to whatever you're trying to lift off the bottom right but if it started lifting too far and the pressure is getting less as it's going up that air is expanding and the buoyancy is increasing and they can run away like uh -huh. the lift bag yeah. you just take off on it so somebody's got to be kind of minding it's got a valve on it that you dump the air out of it to keep it as it's coming up in the water, keep it at a steady, the pace that you expected. Right, and, you know, keep that weight down. Yeah, that's what Tom's talking about there with the, the buoy. So I think the question about bubble wrap, bubble wrap would shrink down to nothing as the, as the pressure, uh, the water pressure increased. Uh, and when it came to the surface, the, if, if the little membrane was still intact, it would re fill to the level that we saw it and it might look almost the same that wow. would be the buoy example that bob gave is right. you, you yeah. took it to depth it's scrunched down to nothing and then it brings it back to the surface and it looks just like the buoy that was so it might not have the same effect as the styrofoam cup that stays shrunken you right. know when we bring it on deck that's kind of the cool part of that <laughs> is the cool like, part i took this to this science. bubble wrap to depth and it yeah. looks the same as the bubble that's wrap that's the awesome we had on the surface yeah so it is the when we do our own oh, our project we've got to, it's got to stay shrunken if we just have the yeah, performance well, criteria yeah. for this <laughs> exactly. endeavor. So what was our depth when we did our color check, our balance check? Uh, we were at the bottom. That was four, just over fourteen hundred meters. Fourteen hundred meters. So yeah. if you were if you were joining us at that time, you saw us do that check. We had that little white piece of tape so we could get a white balance check. Um, I have someone asking about the colors, whether or not they're muted. Um, towards the bottom and um, also some very brightly colored things that we see on yeah. camera. Does that truly translate to what they look like on Good the bottom questions. of the ocean floor? Yeah. Jonathan will be able to chime in a little bit on the... Of course I'd ask that when he left. ...particulars, but there's no light at this depth from uh, the sun, right? So we're bringing all, everything that you see is illuminated by lights either on Hercules or on, at Atlanta. Uh, and so you'll notice as we get, as Herc gets farther away from something, the colors are muted. And as we get closer, they become more vibrant if the thing is, the coral or whatever it is, is colorful. And, and that is the, the wavelengths of light as they, uh, the, they diffract, I guess, in the, through the water, yeah. the, the amount of water between the light source and the object. But things in the deep ocean are, can be colorful. Uh, I'd have to throw it over and we don't have a biologist really with us to talk to what might be the evolutionary advantage to being colorful. I think I was listening in to the discussion uh, at the end of last night's watch and some of the brighter colors are thought to maybe be carryovers from species that adapted at a shallower depth potentially and then have now adapted to a deeper depth and that has just stuck with. But uh, So we don't necessarily, there wouldn't really be a need for coloring. 
at this at dark of the depth. I right? guess I don't. Uh, yeah, I'm not the. Yeah, yeah. But I wonder also if it would just depend on what they are eating. Like it might not true. have any visual reasoning other. It's true. Uh, other than just happens to be whatever they can get. We their heard sponges have smells. Like yeah. what? What's the? I that would know. be similar to like we see with flamingos, right? They're turning that pink color mm -hmm. because of the krill that they're eating. Yeah. Is that why? Yeah. What color is a flamingo if it ate rice and beans or if something? It, <laughs> if it ate rice and beans, well, it depends on if it was white rice or yellow rice. <laughs> and the mixture there. <laughs> Sounds like another O and R experiment. <laughs> So what are we looking for? What do we hope to see on this dive? Um, Benthic Boy wants to know. Yeah, so we are, uh, we're we're going to test the camera systems in uh, some steep terrain. We also are hoping for uh, to be able to assess and characterize the biology that we see here. The particularly, this is uh, this site is 80 million years old. Right, the, some of the sites we were diving on yesterday near the Big Island were a million years old. Give or take a few years. A few million, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> just the plus or minus a few million. So the we've got some images of previous dives that were on the eastern flank of the seamount. There was uh, large corals. They weren't, um, they were sparse. There's um, large basalt outcrops. Um, what we've seen so far in the multi-beam map is a fairly gen like a, it's a it's a slope, but no big um, boulders or terrain that that really uh, scratched our itch for complex terrain to kind of really image around with the camera system. So uh, we may be, as we explore our way back, looking at the seafloor, we may go a little faster than we had previously planned, just because now we have this another source of information to make those determinations. Um, yeah, I think that's what, I mean, we're game for anything. Yeah. We're ready to to have the whale fall, the big ones, you know, but. I hope to have anything that happens in between, all of that. that I would think be the, great. as we get closer, like dinner time tonight, we'll be in the steepest terrain. That'll, from a geology perspective, that might be the most uh, compelling visually. Uh, and as we get closer to the, these ridge lines and the tops of these pinnacles that's also where we see more higher density of the biology so um, I think the first half of this dive is gathering information it might be more uh, the working part and the second half might be the the fun part so for folks if biology boy is or benthic boy what was it what was the uh, benthic benthic boy benthic boy yeah uh, if they want to set an alarm for maybe three or four hours from now, maybe. <laughs> Come back, yeah. We gauge it off of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's yeah, true. but yeah. yeah, for sure, set an alarm. It is a struggle when we, you know, we're here in the van for four hours and uh, just zoned in on the mission. And then you step outside and you, all you smell is like burgers or bacon because yep. the vent is the right there. Is right it hits you the, the second you walk you out the door. The so you immediately like become hungry, if, even if you weren't thinking about it. Nope. And it's been exciting. Like we, i you know, working on the uh, eight to twelve shift. We, we're usually putting, putting in and doing the descent, and you don't necessarily always get all of the interesting things that we um, wa are watching downstairs with the other shifts. But it's yeah. always. Uh, it's always hard to leave because you just never know. It, you just feel like something's just right around the corner, and it literally could be. You know, it's a, it is a pa very patient thing. You have to be patient. The mm -hmm. ship moves are deliberate and slow. You know, the ship then drives. The ship moves. It moves out Atlanta. Then Herc can explore within that new kind of watch circle of its tether. Um, but we saw how quickly things can happen yesterday. Yesterday, day before, day before, with. Uh, uh, at Atlanta being followed on that fishing line, right? And then we had to, we we had what was like a little mini crisis to, to sort out on how to free at Atlanta. And again, the team slowed down once we realized that uh, we were followed. And, and, and the first thing was not to make it any worse. So we right. kept the problem as small as we could and then huddled together and talked through two or three different methods. We could have flown the vehicles out of the fishing line potentially. We 
we could cut, which is what we ended up going with, or as as Robert mentioned earlier, bring the whole mess back to the surface if you thought that as we were kind of interacting with it, that it was one end, it did appear to be um, weighted, but a lightweight. Um, and so we chose to cut the line and you just have the full gamut, you know, we have patient and then uh, particularly too, the li like if we're exploring the seabed, the lights of Hercules are just a few meters in front of us. So the, right. the next big thing is just out of view. You yeah. Know? You don't have this light where you can see. Um, and what if we took that turn a little bit too soon? Yeah. <laughs> you just can't see hundreds of meters. And so uh, it, it keeps you tuned in, right? It is just. It does. It really uh, does. Really riveting to to hope that just in the around the next corner or behind the next rock is the the big thing. So when you guys had all that excitement going on, I was in the in the uh, studio doing a a live a direct interaction with a with a classroom, and we flipped over to the live stream, and we were like, we don't know what's going on. There's a knife like just in the in the Hercules <laughs> arm. <laughs> So I kind of made a joke. I was like, maybe they're getting ready for Halloween or something. Yeah. I don't know what's going on back there. Pull out of. the pumpkin. Yeah, we've just kind of like moved on. But it was really funny. We were like, we have because we weren't listening to SPL. We had no idea what was going on back here. <laughs> well, we flipped over and we were like, oh, okay, that's happening. <laughs> yeah. And when I left the van after after that, I everyone was like, what's going on? I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, kudos to the ROV team for talking through the plans and then executing on one that turned out to be very very safely executed and we were able to just keep going on the mission right we didn't come to the surface and have to regroup in any sort so yeah that was really good so someone's asking will the visual 3d return trip be used to help enhance and validate the sonar mapping data that's exactly oh, what they're doing yeah, yeah. That, it, that chris mentioned we can we can get an intensity of the seafloor to understand hard or soft maybe and we can use the multi-beam to get the bathymetry to how big something might be but we're going to use the camera on the vehicle to go put you know an eyeball basically on it to then characterize what that exactly is that and that's really our exploration mission is to to go out there and use these sensors characterize the seabed and then other scientists will be inspired by the thing that we saw and plan a whole science program around just to go explore whatever that unique element was. And so, yeah, characterizing, using the imagery is a critical element. So I know we have the whale fall video. Do we have any other fossil videos online at nautilus.org? We had the wood fall from the earlier in this expedition. That's true. I know. Yeah. Amazing and rare. It just wasn't as, uh, it hadn't attracted as much life yet, but uh, was absolutely unique. We turned that into so many things before we finally declared it. All right. So, so we have our visually impaired. What was the wood fall? Let's describe it so that we can. Okay. Uh, what did let's you see. I would say tusk, like maybe the shape of a banana. Yep. Shape the the curvature of a banana for sure. Um, How big though? Right, I think it was uh, probably. Uh, yeah, maybe a meter, and it was probably. Uh, yeah, so maybe. Two. It was a f 18 inches to a f two feet in diameter, this log. Right. right? And then it was probably. Twenty. How many hercs? Is it is herc a unit of measure? <laughs> it should be. <laughs> three hercs? <laughs> yeah. Maybe three hercs, so it was probably 20, yeah, 20 it was plus feet. Pretty, pretty And long. had this, like you said, it had this banana shape to it. And that's what really threw us off initially. Right. Because it wasn't, it wasn't straight like a, like you would think a trunk yeah. of a tree or something. No, I saw a tusk. That was the first or thing I thought. Or a big rib bone from some yeah. ancient bone monster. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was like a whale rib bone or something. Yeah. I don't know what it would have been doing all by itself though. <laughs> And then it turned out to be wood. Yep. Which is, you know. Not yet colonized. Yeah, nutrients are sparse in the deep ocean, so a woodfall is a source of nutrients and will attract life. Uh, we were just kind of first on the scene 
yeah. maybe in that How one. old do you think that was? How long do you think it's been sitting there? I don't know. I have no way of knowing. Yeah. I'm not the right. I, I, uh, Robert? It didn't have like. Uh, when is when? Whenever it's a good time, can you please rotate out the um, craft manipulator, uh, just so it's it's outboard. I, I see that white balance card in, in the view of the triclops. Yeah. So science team, we have finished our Norbit survey, uh, and now we're just uh, northwest of. Waypoint one, and so we'll settle yeah, down let's here. Yeah, head to the bottom now. and head our way back. Yeah. And Johan, right. we're going to have to work with Chris because I would like to use his survey to target like rock boulder here, hop to the rock boulder there in okay. the most efficient path uh, we can. Yeah, so I'll, I'll check in with him. Because the slope was seemed around. that there wasn't that much terrain, right, on the way down, so we might want to kind of boogie. Um, I know Dr. Ballard might have some geological interests here when we hit the bottom, we may see him, but uh, once we've made those, that determination, we could probably move out pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you guys need some time on the bottom before we start chugging to calibrate? Um, I would appreciate actually time on our first uh, kind of vertical object of interest, like a boulder or something like that. Um, then I'll need some time to calibrate at that, that point. Sounds good. Roger. All right, there's the bottom in sight. We're stowing the manipulator a little bit, keep it out of the view. Thanks, Robert. Steve, you can, set the, you can take that and set it up there if you oh, want to be go. closer to the pilots in there. And to those of you watching, thank you for your patience as we're working through our different satellite feeds and determining which one we're going to feature on which screen. We've got a couple of different missions going on here, but our first is the mapping and the sonar going. So thank you for thank you for letting us know that you prefer Herc on channel one. <sighs> Get kind of used to it. Switch that for you. Sounds good. Thanks, Pete. Can we uh, put the Herc on the upper? Yeah. Uh, well, at least in the van, the upper monitor. Yes, please. Perfect, thank you. All right, this is, uh, so, can we get a, a zoom of the seabed here? These, if we get settled out or you guys are in a good place, just.
Yeah, maybe off to the right, that thick, thicker black, like a uh, little pebbled area. Thanks, Robert. Yes, sir. Let me know if you want more. I got more. Yeah, go for it. Now we're looking at sand. Yeah, okay. So we've got a few geologists on board that are gonna contribute, but one of the things we, we were interested in that we thought we might find, especially at a seamount that's you know 80 million years old, is uh, the potential for these manganese nodules and, and uh, these small, looks like pebbles here, are kind of some early indicators that that was likely a correct hypothesis so this is interesting we'll keep our look out, keep a look out as we keep going up but uh johan you can get us moving and we can we can get get going sounds good uh. okay robert we're gonna start off probably well, following the same track as we kind of took to get Christian, here. Christian, you got the spe oh, you got the species guide there. If you see anything in your record, Robert, is, it is there good? is there any more room to move that manip out of the view of? Oh, never mind. Uh, the camera's tilted a little right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, no. Uh, yes. Two four zero. But down here, maybe. This is closer. Closer. That one here. That one, maybe. Something like that. Are you close. comfortable with how Atalanta is positioned? Relative to you? Or. Right. You'll just come along here. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm going to reset your GVL. Boom. Back on track. Alright, and we'll get the ship moving. Bridge, bridge, nav, three zero at two four zero, please. Three zero at two four zero. Really excellent. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna uh, jump off for a sec and uh, huddle with Dr. Mayor and Dr. Ballard just to. Be right back. Uh, Peep, did you end up doing a white balance or um, of the main camera? We had um, inconsistent white on the white balance because uh, yeah, we yeah. had a dirtied up white balance tape from before. Uh, yep. So we're going to try to find some whiter tape whiter, not whiter, yep. tape for uh, next step. Roger. But I recall the last preset. Okay. I'm just trying to manually match the uh, color balance between the two until I get that fiducial out. And uh, could we get the triclops on the upper right of the quad? Um, the control van quad? the request on our big screens here. Signs left, I think. What? I think he put it in a bio box. Oh, I hope so. I, I'm 90% sure he put it on the inside of the bio box. Uh, yeah, uh, I cop copy that, Pete. No worries. Yeah, yeah, Raj. Okay. 
Okay. Now, Kristen, I have a viewer that wants to know if it's possible if you can tell whether or not the ocean floor was ever above sea level at this point. Ship is starting to move. Like here at this exact spot that we're looking at? Yeah, this particular section. Hmm. That's an excellent question. Honestly, I think we would have to take some samples to determine that, um, do a kind of a core sample and be able to see what is below the surface. Yeah, Pete, if you want to put uh, Triclops upper right, that'll work, yeah. So it's interesting, um, Dr. Beller was talking about this morning that the, you know, on a slope like this with these uh, small pebbles, nodules, like marble sized, uh, it looks like um, bits of rock on the seabed. That gravity is still a thing, and so they they almost can flow over millions of years into just like a drainage pattern you see associated with a river or something. And so I think that's what we're seeing. These you know the how they are these darker bunches um, are kind of low spots, and these small nodules are tumbling of sorts over you know, whatever, millions of years down slope. Because there is, there is a little current here. I don't know if, Robert, you can assess what the current might be. Doesn't look like the umbilicals that affected by anything significant. All right, looks like that is on the move. So, Jonathan, in the Triclops uh, starboard fisheye. Yep. Is that the on the left side of that image? Is that the other fisheye that we're seeing? Yeah, that's correct. That's okay. the other dome. Um, that's the that's the starboard. I'm sorry, the port side dome yeah, yeah. that you can see that little spot of light. And I actually have the cameras in two different configurations right now. One is a rectilinear view on the left hand side. Um, that's a port camera, and on the starboard camera, that's the full fisheye. Uh, they accomplish two different goals in this configuration. One is the photogrammetry element, and then the one on the right-hand side, um, should we choose, provides just a little bit more coverage. Um, but the biggest thing is that it's recording the 180-degree monoscopic view. So if we put people inside of a headset, um, you can actually look around uh, yeah. just 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 flat, um, but a really cool kind of dome theater perspective. Yeah, as if you were the ROV kind of. As if you were the ROV. Yeah, that's fun. We should. That's going to be awesome. I have this see. vision for like at the end of the expedition, we always have a little barbecue, and I imagine <laughs> like the images of three or four people in the headsets, like <laughs> kind of breaking all this out after we've had a chance to process. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a challenge, a challenge with this really is the processing. We have a fantastic and dedicated crew down in the data lab right now. Into where Norbit is? Yeah, that's fine.
thank you so much to those of you that have been watching during the beginning parts of this particular dive. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for all the questions and comments that have been sent in. We've had some good ones. Popcorns to pumpkin. We're going to begin the middle of our bridge, bridge shift nav, change. Three zero at two four zero. Be the end of your eight to twelve and incoming twelve to four. So uh, will be taking Robert, over. if if it would be helpful, you you're free to move out the porch and the uh, bio box where the cameras are mounted until you can see the upper edge of those in the downward facing cam. Yeah. Uh, you can tilt down just enough so you can see the top of the cameras. That's okay. Yeah, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Roger. Yeah, and Pete, is that banged out as far as it'll go? Yeah, Roger. Yes, it is. Ready? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's, per that's perfectly fine. All right, thanks again for joining us. Ale is going to be taking over your 12 to 4 watch. We're still running. I'll see you again at the 8 to 12 for later on this evening. Uh, well, I mean, as always, you're, you're, I Okay, uh, Robert, Pete, um, we have a request from Bob back here um, to do a zoom in, quick frame grab of the, uh, of the pebbles here. As, yep, as up close and personal as Hercules can get. Oh, let me know when you're ready. Let me know when you're ready, Bob. Copy that. Yeah, he's going in. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, Kristen, if we can get a couple of good good stills of this? That's as tight as I can. With Hermit Crab for reference, and actually speaking of that, could we maybe get lasers on please, sir? There you go, There's lasers in frame, Kristen. Yeah, Roger, thank you. Yes, sir. And, um, you know, I, can we uh, keep the downs on? I really like that view from, uh, yeah, no, I know. Don't let Dan, don't let Dan hear this, but that adjustment he made without telling me to the downward lights is actually really nice. But don't, don't let him, don't let him hear that. Go straight to his head. Oh, well, I know what looks good. All right, folks, video switching out. See you, Pete. Thank you all.
There you go. Well, good job. Hercules is yellow, yeah, that's correct. Got to do something for that. Good immersive. Yep. How come uh, one box is opaque and one is not? What's up with that? Uh, Dan, I put the configuration, uh, the uh, port side camera is zoomed in at 15 oh, millimeters. I see, I see, I see, yeah. uh, so I just made it less opaque. Right. I suppose it would look okay. Let oh, me. No, let me. I just, I get it now. Okay. I was just curious. It does not appeal to my sense of symmetry. Um, and we do have the downward lights on, which is absolutely fine, I think. In this case, yeah, I would say, uh. Could you actually try rack backing the cameras a bit rack backing rack back atalanta is still on the move eight meters left on the surface probably we really need a tilt on these cameras and yep. uh Ren yeah. Rennie and dan when when you get all settled in what we'd like to do is try to move down slope a little and then follow follow these uh streaks yeah and drive up drive up once we get to the to the notch, to the notch. So I can zoom out here on high pack. You can see um, what we're looking at here. Yep, um, thank you. Yep. So for a down slope would be this direction. And that'll go on for quite a bit. There is a saddle over here. That's a bit far from what our planned track is. Um, but the, the down slope will keep yep. going down. Uh, Dan, did 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 you manage to rack back those cameras fully? Uh, I didn't fully rack them back. I just can, racked can them back till I saw what, what? manipulator in the port one. Yeah, right there. Yeah, that's what he said. Keep keep going on the rack back. That manipulator is all in the black anyway. I don't mind. Right I just I'm trying to get it so that we could just barely see the front porch on the on the port side one. Keep going. Right that's good. I don't know. Perfect. If the, I don't know if the porch is in or out or not. It's just a little bit in. I don't mind that. Thank you. Oh, you don't know if the porch is. Yeah. I guess if if possible, we can get the porch. Uh, yeah, the porch was in. all the way in. Well, I really like that. Yeah. That's the porch all the way in. Okay. Thank you. That is just an incredible view on the 360 fisheye. So, Larry, how far downslope do you want to go? Okay, we'll down further. Yeah, we want to keep going. Yep. Okay. Um, so you're seeing here on the map what I'm going to do. I'm going to yep. to go I north see it. west. Yep. Okay, right. yep. If you can right now, off to the off to the right. Yep. Off to the right. Yep. Roger. Going off to the right. I will, uh, as you turn to the right, Dan, I'll see yep. how much uh, yep. we, we need to move the ship and how much. Or down. It's actually down. Roger. Yeah. Down the slope until yep. this. Yep, right, yep, yeah, right where this dark is. Are we in orbiting down or are we? No, just looking at this this field here. Right, yeah, if you can follow follow the follow the dark streak now forward. Oh, you want to look at the nodule? Yes. Potential nodules. Yeah. Right of that. Herc's gonna uh, drag his tail a little, so. Make some dust to right. behind well, let's see, but it would be nice if we can zoom in and, and see what that is. What do you want to like zoom in? Is yeah, that please. Okay. Let me uh, come around and put them uphill yeah. so you get a good zoom. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You ready? Uh, video we can, we can start there, Copy that. Yeah, I'll focus. tilt down and you'll get a close, close, close up. Wow, we have that camera. Are, the laser, are the lasers there? Yeah, I can just barely see them at the. Um, I don't think uh, lasers are on still. Oh, I see, I see right at the bottom of the top lasers frame. Lasers are right? indeed on. Yeah, oh. I see the, the, the top, the top screen, the very bottom. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, but I don't know. Yeah. Right. There they are. There they are. There we go. That's one of them. 
They're both there in the uh, cinema cam. I got a couple of good high resolution stills I too. I think he's, uh, he put on a bio box. What's that? We did put on the bio box, that's correct, sir. Yeah, so it's Would so you like a scoop? A few samples, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's take a scoop of that. And, uh, Roger that. Yeah. Taylor, and I'll let you know, or you'll let me know what uh, number it is. Yeah, it'll, this will be zero, zero, 002. Two. Thank you. Maybe you don't have your computer up here. Oh, but if you, I took a look, we're right, right on top of uh -huh. Right on top of the back of the Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. I went in your room. Uh -huh. I did pick a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, hit, I hit the dollar you gave me, so. Right. I, I, We have a question coming in, uh, and also welcome to the 12 to 4 watch. Um, does life tend to concentrate in the valleys underwater like it does on land? Do nutrients settle more in the valleys? Well, okay, I'll take a stab at that. I'm not a biologist, but it, I think it's actually just the opposite. Um, what we're seeing is the, in this case, it's the nodules that are settling in the valley. I think, uh, or the sand, yeah, that kind of rolls downhill. It is, I think. The evidence is that uh, life tends to like to live on the ridges uh, where it intercepts the currents, where, where, where it in intercepts the current a little better. We saw that quite a bit uh, in the last few days, um, particularly in the area of the uh, sills and the flows that we saw. Uh, we're on the edges that were standing up high. That's where all the crinoids yeah, were that's, and, all, yeah. and all the corals were. Out there where the current would hit them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. where so the, they, they like They like solid and stable stuff, not, not things that are going to move. Yeah. Like living on and yeah. we also have holotherians and things that filter through the sediment. They'll be, they'll be happier down in the plains than in any of those large fields of sediment. So different kinds of life in um, different places. Okay, so you're, the, the request is for a big scoop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the only kind yeah, of scoop Yeah, 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 it's... it's Right, yeah, we don't need deep. Okay, so here's here's the bag. Yeah, watch it. You. Just gonna uh, set it down. Uh, no, nope. uh, none there, none there. Um, no, nope. we'll get you one in the back. No, they're all, oh. There is none there. It's, it's only there. Yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> I presume. <laughs> what Canadian put that hockey puck on my scoop? Hmm. Huh? Is that you, Ray? Just use Larry's. Use Not Larry's. Yeah, Dan, just uh, fill it up. Is uh, very interesting. Look at that sand. Look at that. Look at that view. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty remarkable. The the fish eye and the yeah. Roger that. I will uh, shake the mud out. That's a cool view tell on Dr. that fisheye. Tell Dr. Ballard we're going to have to uh, drop a weight because we're going to have so much manganese in the. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Bob. I'll get. Oh, thank you, Larry. I can. I can help him. All right, everyone. There you go, Bob. You press press that button to talk. That the right, right, red right one. Right here. Now you're live. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yeah. Live. Cool. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Get rid. Of, get, you can get rid of the sediment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not my first rodeo. 
Um, can you explain uh, why we're collecting these and what's the value in them? They're a battery and a rock. Yep. Uh, yep, yeah, basically these are uh, very, very ancient uh, seamounts that were created in the mid-Cretaceous period around 80 to 100 million years ago. Yeah, I think this one's been dated at about 82 million 82 years. 82 million years, 80 million old. years old. And it's been sitting here for, for all that time. It was only a one-time eruption due to a, a phenomena called the mid-Cretaceous superplume, if you want to look it up. And it was when the mantle was uh, completely turned over and you have massive amounts of volcanic eruptions in the ocean floor. But that you have to find ocean floor that's that old. Most of the ocean floor in the world's oceans has been subducted of that age. So this is a, an area where you have these ancient, ancient volcanoes and they seem to be spalling off uh, nodules uh, very at very shallow depths uh, and our sampling of them uh, in, in another set of mid-Cretaceous seamounts to the north called the Chautauqua had very high concentrations of rare earths. So one of our jobs for NOAA is to map and characterize, even though this is a, uh, funded by the Office of Naval Research, they're equally interested in rare earths. So we're just taking a little quick sample. Uh, on the last cruise, we were able to use uh, Dr. Larry Mayer's uh, DRIX autonomous surface vessel that has a new multi-beam sonar system that is at a much higher frequency than the one we have on the Nautilus. And he was able to see uh, these flows uh, acoustically and so what we're trying to do is to ground truth that acoustical database because the acoustical system can see and map areas much, much faster than we can visually. So we're fundamentally ground truthing that sonar map right now and then we'll get back to our imaging. So yeah, this so is a twofer. Yeah. And, and I think you, it's interesting that you talked about this being your Cretaceous Seamount, so you know, 82 million years. It wasn't formed here at all. It was formed uh, way back by uh, Central America, where, where the where the East Pacific, East Pacific rise. rise, the ridge crest, is uh, is sitting there now. So it was formed there, and it's moved all the way over here in that time. But it's being subducted uh, off of Japan and the Philippines. So uh, I think that's fine, Robert. That's a good, a good sample. Oh, dude, no, I think they're not. But you'll notice, you'll notice that there's very little life uh, on the bottom because this is a flow. This is a, a gravitational flow down, down slope. So it's pretty hard to live in an avalanche, even though it's slow moving. You don't see any of your typical benthic bur burrowings in benthic community. In fact, you'll see almost no life. See, because those guys like to have a very stable environment. They like to be out where it's flat, and they can make a living and not have it move on them. So, so the, the other interesting thing is that this 82 million year old seamount, and a whole bunch of them, the, the, we're in a, a group of seamounts called the geologist seamounts, which are all of that age, and we're sitting only how many hours away from uh, the Honolulu, island, the, yeah, big, well, the big island, island. Of, the big uh, island, yeah, the big which, island, which is erupting now, and right? So, and so that's. It's very, very different environment. Here we're in this old, old, old piece of the crust, yet... In which the hot spot is right. uh, burning through. So the Hawaiian Islands are this age of oceanic crust, and then they're moving over uh, a hot spot that's now presently located on the Big Island of Hawaii. And in the next couple of days, we'll be going to where it's a new island is being formed. Loihi. Loihi Seamount, and we'll be imaging that as well. But so uh, this is a seamount that was created long before the Hawaiian Island hotspot uh, came into this neck of the woods. And to, and to grow these manganese nodules takes millions of years. Yeah. And so that's why we, we don't see anything like that uh, on... The, what we call the insular slope on the slopes that we were Correct. investigating yesterday and the day before of the big island of Hawaii. So we've got a good sample now. We'll put it in our bio box and we'll continue our imaging as we head up to the summit of uh, Macau Seamount, uh, which typically at the summit, Copy that. you have very intense 
uh, live, mostly sponges and 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 uh, corals that are not living off the terrain, but are living up where the wind is blowing, nutrients by. So we'll find a, a, a lot of corals and sponges uh, further up slope away from this site. Just uh, as we get this tucked away, Chris has processed the Norbit map that we just um, collected. Um, so we have that in both the ROV navigation software and uh, HiPack as well. So we've got that um, so to interrogate features as we come as we come up slope. Already seeing some some big boulder chunks and things on this uh, on this slope to look at. High dollar sample going in the box. It's not in there yet. All right, Rennie, is it that you? Yes. Down there. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a good sample. We're 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 quite happy about that. I don't think we need to keep going down slope anymore. Roger. But if we can uh, kind of pick one of these flows and, and turn around and come up it as far as we can, just now heading back up. Sure. Um, we'll just, uh, once, once we yeah. have everything stowed, we will. Yeah, we, we don't want to ride the ridge line. We want to do the exact opposite. Yeah. We want to ride the axis of the ravine, sort of slalom back and forth as we climb up to the summit. Yeah, Roger, um, with our Norbit map that we just collected, there isn't much of a ridge line at all or anything, really. Yeah. It's just yeah. kind so of a... Right. Um, so I just loaded that in the high pack, and it's really yeah. just Super. A, couple of, a couple of boulders along the way, but a pretty kind of a gentle... Well, that's the idea, yeah. and then periodically we'll probably zoom in. Yeah, but again, if we if we can pick one of these uh, areas where we see these micro-nodules and just kind of follow them up now and see how far that goes upstream right yeah. Yeah. or uphill. We'll kind of yeah. Just for reference, that was sample number 002. Roger. I have that. If you've ever been in Arizona or New Mexico or where you have uh, very little vegetation uh, and you'll see sediments coming off the mountain ranges, uh, they come off as little rivulets and they head down slope and it creates what we call a dendritic drainage pattern. And then little rivers come into bigger ones and bigger ones until they finally go into the Mississippi right. or the Rio Sorry, Grande or whatever. So we have the same kind of process underwater. Mm -hmm. It's a water sure. water so flows downhill, and so does sediments. Yeah, a, a little more slowly. A more, little more, more slowly. Most of the time. Uh, but it forms the same uh, dendritic drainage pattern, All and the then it accumulates at the base of the volcano in what they would call an alluvial plane. Sure. Which yeah. you see on land. Uh, so, so here we're going to try areas. to follow this this R a flow. Flow. Well, I'm trying to look for the right word. Let's call it a flow, and we we'll see we'll follow follow it upslope now. But you'll notice again as we come in on it, you do not see any burrowing, which is classic on an abyssal plain or even any flat sediment surface where the ground ain't moving. Uh, animals will set up a whole ecosystem. Uh, <laughs> That's not happening here. Yeah. So for all our fans of deep sea life, this is not going to be the best for you. But when we get a little higher... Not we'll, a good we'll place to raise a family. No, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, sorry, I missed that. Why is there no, no burrowing? burrowing? Because it, the, it's the, on the... Mo it's moving. stuff is moving, probably. Very slowly, but it's moving. And it's pretty hard to live on, a, on an avalanche. Hmm. And so this is a flow... This literally, and then when we've seen bigger ones, when the nodules are much larger, like the ones we saw on Chautauqua, uh, they're literally, literally tumbling, they're rolling. And so uh, it's not, a, like I say, it's pretty hard to set up a house and a uh, ground's moving on you. Kind of like living in California, eh? <laughs> But just like uh, larger nodules, these little ones just completely stay on the right. surface. We yeah. saw that when he dug in, that there was no presence. Uh, and it's a question is, do they grow with on time? Because they, they take a long time. We're also, when we get up to the summit and we get into the coral and sponge community, we're going to keep our eye out for dead ones, because this is interesting. Uh, when this seamount was formed, uh, 
back in the mid Cretaceous, you can count on it being immediately colonized at the summit by corals and, and, and sponges. And then they naturally live their life and die and fall next to the next one. And when we were on Chautauqua, we saw a lot of ancient corals. And th this is not biology, it's called paleontology, where you're looking at creatures that lived a long, long time ago. And so the big interesting question is, do you have a time capsule of ancient, fundamentally, fossils that have uh, been dying on this seamount for this period of time? Because when we recovered the ones from Chautauqua, the dead ones, they were completely covered in manganese oxide. They were black, which meant they would, were there a very, very long time. And if you were to collect a sufficient number of them, you might be able to see the evolutionary history of them over tens of millions of years. And the question is, have they changed? Now, this is a fairly stable world where we live down here, where change doesn't occur rapidly. But certainly the fish and other creatures have evolved through time, have the corals and sponges. So we're going to be wanting to photograph those when we see them. And I think I did see one solitary sponge yep. sitting there off just on the uh, on the fisheye camera, but that was it. That's a rock that wasn't yeah. <laughs> well, you get to the edges of the flow. I can't believe it. You get to the edges of these flows. Uh, on the ridge line, you'll see solid rock. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I kind of <coughs> drifted off to the south southwest here, uh, following this black. Yeah, just, just, yeah, keep, yeah, keep, keep, keep following it. It's, it's okay. okay. But try, try, try to keep heading uphill too, if you can. Does he have this display? <laughs> um, yeah. Roger. Uh, this, uh, this is the Hypex uh, survey display. To our left. Dr. Bauer, you're not on SPL. Yeah, if you can pull up your Hypex uh, map, you'll see where you are in the big picture of the topography. Uh, that's Chris's, that, yeah. Chris's job. That's above it my should, grade. I don't see it up there yet. What's it called? IPEC survey. Yeah. But clearly this, this is it. And this is where we've got a particular sonar signature. So we can use that to uh, quantify it because we know it has no depth. So it's really X, Y, no Z, except the size of the nodule itself. So you can get a pretty good number on how much mass is here. And uh, make a move to... Which is the game we're playing. Uh, put Atlanta on Herc. Make it yeah, you see that now? Then yeah. so you'll see, you uh, if you zoom out a little, yeah, the right other here. way you'll see you'll see what you want to navigate to stay in the ravine as you summit. Yeah, there's not much, of, not really not much of a ravine here, but... It, well, it eventually it's, will be. It is, yeah. It'll all, if you zoom out on that, because you're pretty tight in, you'll see the big picture. But it, but it is all... Yeah, yeah keep so going out a little more and more and more. The, the more you go, yeah, you'll start seeing the game you're playing as you head to brighter color. In fact, can you jump out real far to see the summit? Just to get the, there it is. Yep. So that's the game. Yeah, so just so that track line is exactly what we want is you to follow. That'll get you to the summit. Look how black this is, just a big flow, isn't it? Bang. So what kind of analysis will be done on these nodules when they get back? They'll do the geochemistry on them and see what their composition is. Uh, and it's, uh, again, what we're focusing on is their rare earth com uh, composition. Rare earths are pretty important in the electrical energy world of tomorrow and of all now. 
and we don't have a lot of rarest deposits. And the big controversy is can you recover them without doing damage to the habitat? And the key is to find a place that has no habitat. All seas have done some uh, trials already. Recovery. Yeah, they did. Actually, there was a study you can look up online. Uh, Scripps and uh, MIT mm -hmm. did a simulator. But that was for manganese nodules, which is in a habitat that really has a habitat, because that's right. flat. Yeah, that was, uh, that was on the kind of flat abyssal plane. Yes. It was a real concern that uh, dur during mining, you stir up a lot of sediment. Right. And that sediment will... The question yeah. is, how long will it stay in suspension? And does it get into the water column? Does it get up into, if, if you're uh, using water to raise it to the surface, do you then get into the euphotic zone and the surface uh, 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 zone? And you literally uh, fill them up with their, their you know, their, their, their filter feeders. Right. And well, this well, is well, take it, even down, we see the crinoids, the, the curls, the, the filter feeders. Right. And so... That suspended sediment. Um, but as I recall, in that particular study, the sediments didn't go very far. That, that study showed it. They, didn't, it as didn't just as we just what we did when we were uh, lifting up those uh, mini nodules and shooking of the sediments, immediately fell back down to the bottom. Intrigued with that. Hey, that wow. Dark. What that dark line, line is there? Yeah, that's in It looks. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be man-made. Yeah, that's wow. can't. What the heck is that? You want to want to zoom in on that puppy? Sure. Yeah, just kind of follow that line. That uh, is wild. It's video it's four. old, whatever it is. There, Copy that. Huh? Uh, to the left, to the left. To the left. left, left. Yeah, sorry. There it is. It's just a, wild. A bit of darker nodules. Two flows hitting. I don't know. Okay. That's odd. Yeah, you zoom out, and oh, okay, I guess we, we get the bigger picture up above in the, yeah, yeah. Tri in the tri triclops. be interesting to see yeah. Yeah. two flows have come together. That left uh, stereo camera odd. there gives me a uh, roadmap yes. to follow. But yeah. it also, yeah, let's follow the, yeah, follow, follow, follow the, not follow the yellow the brick road, <laughs> <laughs> the black road. That's interesting. Always something tickling your yeah. brain. Yeah. Uh, this is crazy. <laughs> they painted Range the highway. They got a mm -hmm. passing Two five lane and a. One eight five. <laughs> While I'm waiting for the ship here, I'm going to yeah. just get a 90 out. So you're, you're basically heading uh, south. Right? Yeah. 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 South southwest. Oh, the ship is, but the line is. Uh. Stud. Dust cloud five. Two four zero. Look at that line. That is a hood. A uh, viewer's asking if it could have been something that was eroded, like Well, it's a, almost the opposite. Yeah, it's, it's, it's standing uh, up it's, a little high. It's standing it's a little uh, a stacking of the mm -hmm. nodules mm -hmm. and that but I don't we're not seeing a lot of quote flow no. in the in the nodule flow. But you know, that's Food for thought. Never seen that. I've seen a lot of ocean floor, that's for sure. Sixty some years of it. Ale, now that we're kind of settled into this watch, do we want to do round robin? Yeah, that'd be awesome. You want to start us off? Oh, I didn't realize I was volunteering <laughs> for that, but sure, I'll go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Manel Morangi. I am the video engineering intern. Um, on this expedition. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, um, but I've been telling everyone I'm from D.C. because that's easier. Um, and uh, this is my, my first time on the Nautilus and I've been having a great time. Um, yeah, I've got a filmmaking background and really kind of leaning into this broadcast system that we've got going on here. So it's, it's a new direction, but I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. So I'm loving we're, it. We're actually running. Yeah. East All right. well, we love that. We like steam, but we like STEM even is better. <laughs> okay. We like getting the, you know, the, the arts into our game as well. Yeah. It's a, it's a really cool intersection. Um, oh, I'm going downhill. That's why. Yeah. It's yep. just a, it's, 
Okay. I don't know. I mean, there's so much science and technology that goes into just every single camera. I mean, as we've been learning with, you know, Jonathan's triclops here. Yeah, let's just continue our Ale, you wanna, track. you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so I am Alejandro Martinez. I go by Ale. I am a seventh grade science teacher in uh, from Eagle Pass, Texas. So, sorry, that, you wanna continue, just continue on the track or continue along this? Continue line? on the track. Okay, yeah. Roger. All right, so, Dan, that's yeah, gonna be we, more of a... We, we, two, we were starting to head downhill because there is, there is two, a notch two, in the ravine. Right yeah. Off, off to the east there. We're leaving this mystery for the next yeah. generation to solve. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, All right, you're up. Here. Rachel, go ahead. Oh, look, there's another line to follow. Hi, everyone. Bridge, uh, bridge, bridge nav. Two five meters, one nine five. Sitting in the uh, Science One position, I am Rachel Simon. Uh, you've probably seen me rotate the last couple dives with Jonathan Feely. So Jonathan is the wide field camera lead for this exposition, expedition, and I'm one of the engineers. Yeah, okay. Croppings and stuff over this way. I don't know if that's what Ooh. we want to. Yeah. Now it's sitting on a rock. Yeah. yeah. So if you, yeah. yeah. Now here's a classic. Yeah. There's yeah. finally yeah. a rock that's not yeah. in the flow, and someone camps out on it right away, <laughs> <laughs> desperate oh, for right. things that don't that's move. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm Bob Ballard. I'm the president of the Ocean Exploration Trust, and I'm also a professor at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. Larry? I'm Larry Mayer. I'm the, the watch leader on this uh, watch, and I am the director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. Taylor Ann? Hi, everyone. I'm Taylor Ann. Uh, what we're looking at here, actually, before I introduce myself, is a Walteria sponge, which Walteria. is a glass sponge. Um, and you could see there's actually some shrimp w inside of it. So this is probably the first life that we've been seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm not on the Nautilus as a science manager, I am a research assistant at UCLA and a master's student at Cal State Northridge. Um, but my job here on the Nautilus is to log all observations throughout our dive um, and to process our samples and make sure that they're going to where they're supposed to to get processed and so we can share all of our data and uh, the results with the world. Here's so. another one for you. Identify quickly. Yeah, yeah, this is a right. stalked eupectelid sponge. Yep, attached to. We're now at the contact between the flow and the bedrock. Yeah, there you can see those two. So you're now coming in rocks, on the volcanic terrain, through which the uh, the flows are going through. But even here, you'll notice that, other than the periodic attached sponge, you don't have your typical benthic community, because a lot of the hiding spaces has been covered now by this right. long yeah, deposition uh, of manganese crust. We so, had, uh, we had a viewer asking if there. we knew how thick that covering was, like how thick to the basement. Uh, oh, it's very, very it, thick. It, it can, just, it, it can, it, no, wait a minute. What do we got here? Stop. I'll stop. What is that? Large clusters of rock. No, see. that, but below that. See below. that color? And yeah. Okay. What are we got going here? Zoom in on that. Is that a dead sponge? Is that a hole fast? I see, see one off to, right off, to, off to the right hand side too. Off to the right side. Yeah, on that's on a the lower right. No, I'm, yeah, but I'm looking at the down camera. But yeah, see there you go. Yeah, you see, see. Yeah. yeah. And that picture. So that, that's a group of pillows there. That yeah, I'm looking at that hole yeah, fast yeah, just yeah. up in the upper one. Right, and I'm looking at see what's on the bottom. The one over there. Yeah, if you right. could. Peek over at that one that's laying on the side in the lower right of that camera. See it? Right off to the no, the off the to the, the right. The other. The lateral right. Lateral right. Yeah, the other right. See that's him right. off yeah, in the right distance. Yeah. Just laying down. Yeah. Right over some mid mid frame now. Yeah, yeah. The uh, might be a, flat a, thing. The far one. Yeah. Right. The other one, there was actually one right where we, we were. Yep, you see it on the yeah. left. There. Yeah, on the left, you'll see that lower left one that we were sitting on top. There it is. See the one on the lower left? Yeah. You were on top of it. Yeah. And you'll see it's hold fast. If you uh, pivot and, and uh, to the left, pirouette to the left, and then see that little white foot? That's stop, yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah. zoom in. That should okay. be its hole fast. Okay. I look at that boundary with the nodules just, just at the yeah. edge of the. So that's probably a dead 
sponge. Yeah. So if you could zoom in on that. Go ahead. Copy that. Zoom in. So is this indicative of the movement that you were describing earlier? Well, this are the ancient ones that have died. The ancient ones, okay. And it just fall over. They just... Yeah. Or is that a critter? What is that? No, no, I think, I think, no, I think that's yeah. a... Yeah, that's uh, an old... A dead wall too. But look at the... Zoom in a little tighter on this... It's the white stuff. ...odd-looking marble thing. Yeah. The, the oh. brown... Yeah, the what are we stuff, looking yeah. at? Is that yeah, as tight as you yeah. can right. get? No, go for it, Copy. It's like popcorn. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. odd. What's that? Yep. Yeah, that is odd. You're always looking for things you've never seen before, and I've never seen. And these look like, you know. Like a pile of popcorn. Right. And, and More they food. look rounded, like it, this is stuff that could have been uh, rolled and eroded. Or, I have no idea. Or precipitated. Yeah. I have no idea. But we're here to image, and. Boy, it's tempting to just turn into a science design. <laughs> yeah. we got to get back to our primary guys that would always want to at least take a photograph. So no samples, but that's different. Yep. That's what I love about going where no one has ever been. It's constantly seeing things you've never seen. All right, we'll get back to work. Okay, pull back out, and I, I would like to take a look at what's right. on the lower right there, too, though. Look at that. Yeah, I think we had a dead ferrate sponge also on yeah. the right hand side. Yeah, the roughly that? looking yeah, if you, sponge. If you wouldn't mind, mind one more zoom off uh, on the lower right here. That or guy? Just fur no, further, further. Further. There right it is. Right there. Yeah, uh, that, what's just coming into view there. Right. And I zoom in on that one and see if we can figure out what Yeah, that, that one, lower one. That looks like a dead one as well. I believe that's Pan a Pan down. Okay, video, you can go tight there. That Copy looks that. like a dead sponge. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about the dust cloud. Yeah, there that's uh, enough. Now, pan down. Yeah, that looks like a dead sponge. These are, again, fossils. And it's got that popcorn in there, yeah. too. Wild. And then just to the right of it, you see it on the upper camera. It's another. Uh, uh, yeah, this is what some, we saw before. The, the these camera. are these are ancient fossils on this old seamount. Wild. And is that a like miniature sea star just below it? Yeah, a little brittle star. Brittle star. Mm -hmm. All righty. So uh, back row, this is Nav. Um, yes. Look beyond. If you look it. at the if you look at the high pack screen, mm -hmm. look are we looking popcorn. for? More for okay, rocky outcropping types answers. areas or Copy flat that. areas or what? It, like, what's our target? We're really just trying to get the lay of the land, seeing the distribution of these flows. Okay, because um, it looks like yeah, up, up to this direction we have right, some larger, of, yeah. we have yeah. larger features. So yeah, I like, wouldn't, I wouldn't obsess on that. I would just continue up, up to the summit. Yeah, and and well, if you kind of try to join up to to the to the uh, Norbit track down. Yeah. I think we'll head through one of those rocky areas anyway. Yeah, it looks like we got a nice one coming up yeah. up this way. Look, look at these cross sections of the pillows. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful image in the Triclox uh, camera. Again, that cooling structure we, we talked about all the time in terms of that. Especially that coral right on top, just the yeah. star of the show. Always is. <laughs> Didn't even notice the car. I like just yeah. looking at the rocks. <laughs> Geologist. <laughs> Geologist first. <laughs> I, I'm an equal opportunity explorer. I love it all. When I was in school, I double major, double minored. <laughs> Couldn't make up my mind. Still have it. <laughs> minored in physics and mathematics, and majored in geology and chemistry. How did you juggle all of that? I just studied hard. <laughs> And when you're dyslexic, you have to study extra hard. <laughs> uh, but I would memorize my notes. That was how I did it. Did you have a, a favorite? I guess no, because you didn't. No, I love it all. Gotcha. I, I love being a Swiss Army knife. Bridge, bridge, nav, three, That's zero, a great two, way to put it, five. Swiss Army knife. I'm interested in everything. <laughs> Chris, could you could you zoom out on the uh, Hypex survey display, please? For a you second? want to kill the Sorry, lasers again, for the minute, the Bob? Roger. There say we go. again, Larry. You. Could no, you no, zoom no, out no, on no, the Hypex no. survey display for a moment? Roger. Roger. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Good. Good. 
affirmative bridge. So I you'll go pretty much where he's headed is it well, well is how we headed this one. He's gonna he's gonna be heading yeah. over here. The it looks like the valley's that yeah, way. The, but that's I mean That's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So we're centered back uh, up on our I think track there, Dan. Yeah. So let's bring a let's get a bearing or a heading, sorry, of uh two two five. Two two five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. happens to be my current heading. That's all oh, we work. made it. We fingerprinted it. All right, let's. Nav copies, thank you, Bridge. Let's yeah, right continue. When you get a little closer. The sonar. Are we sending out the sonar? Yes, it's on yeah. feed three. This is really creating the, the big picture. Uh, what's the frequency of that sonar? 400 kilohertz, so very high frequency. You know, in in, uh, in our game, it's range versus resolution. You can't have them both. I've, I've been talking about that for days. Yes, and our sonar on the bottom of the ship is 12, 30, 30. 30 kilohertz. And so clearly it sees a big picture, but not in the detail. So we, as you do this kind of work, we call it the zooming in effect. You start off with the big picture and you zoom in through your acoustical sensors and then you make the transition and the jump to optical and that's the game and not get lost in the zoom yeah yeah where's the ship chris can you show me the ship please all right all right, we should be coming up on a rocky outcrop here. Head to your uh, right a little bit there, Oh, Dan. look, a sea cucumber. Hey, Jonathan. Highlight. Keep going, keep <laughs> going. <laughs> so a synelactid sea yeah. cucumber. Yeah, I feel like I have to. <laughs> totally, you got to. You gotta. Yeah, you can see the contact of the flow yeah. lower left. So it's a cinematic, a, uh, so it belongs on the cinema cam. A what terrain, I which is in itself right. is a mass wasting Right, and that's because he's, he's heading further yeah. to the east, so towards that. Yeah, head yeah. up to your you know, right there, Dan. There's a I nice contact between the flow and the right? terrain. But yeah, yeah we're, that's so the way so we're headed. Okay. Like it, yeah, what we're seeing is that the stretch Roger that. Particularly this area here, which we're entering now, is should have a lot of flow because it doesn't have much microtopography. Yeah. I have a question for the group. Does anyone know how things get their scientific names? Like, I know they're very, like, Latin and stuff, but, like... Yeah, I think uh, it depends. So sometimes they uh, yeah, historically have right. been named after yeah. people, but they've kind of moved away from doing that. Um, but it depends on where it fits taxonomically, um, as well as I think sometimes they will describe uh, sure. the species itself, what it looks like, um, and use Latin yeah, words that associate with that. Um, but yeah, there's there are committees that do this, uh, and I'm not familiar with their exact process, but they definitely have a whole procedure that they follow. Yeah, I think a person range, who range, uh, range, finds range, a new so species two, six, uh, will nominate or suggest a name and then goes to a, a, an official naming committee and they see if it meets the rules and they're happy with it. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's named for the location it was found in. <laughs> I have to chuckle. I had a species named after me. I'm not sure I'm... A, Enthusiastic. It's a carnivorous sponge. And, and oh, I, and I, 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 that's I, cool. I, I, that's I, I, have, I have one too. Yeah. It's a Soretolithus. What? It's called Soretolithus larry mayeri. Yeah. It's, it's an, oh my god! It's, really? It's, it's an aberrant species with a large proboscis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I didn't get to vote on that one they named after me. I don't think a carnivorous <laughs> sponge was. <laughs> I want to be known for. You also are known for the name of uh, what rusticles, right? Yeah, that's now an official word. Yeah. Name. Oxford Dictionary sent me a note that when I saw, found the Titanic and they had like uh, iron oxidizing bacteria, actually, that film foam car, uh, uh, cocoons because they want an acidic environment to live in. So they formed a little cocoon while they oxidized the, uh, the iron on the Titanic and and I, I didn't know what to call it because it looked like icicles, so yeah. I called it a rust sickle. And then I, years later, I got a letter from Oxford Dictionary that said it's now an official word. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's oh well. amazing. Yeah. And this I is... Even black smokers, which are not smoke, but 
Yeah. The name stuck. So now we're climbing into this uh, much more rocky uh, area, and, and we're actually getting up above the the uh, bottom of the, the little ravine. And so now we're getting much more life. We're getting away from those mag manganese nodules, which appear to be constrained to the to the deepest part of the ravine. Yeah, and here we have our first large coral fan, at least on my watch. I don't know what happened the watch before. Um, and this is a primnoid with uh, some brittle star associates you can see on there. But here again, almost exclusively corals and sponges with no, you don't see any crabs, you don't see any fish, because you can see the filling in of all the stones have been smoothed and the niches are gone. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice fascinating. Good, it thing we're not, good thing we're not doing our shrimp count on this right. one. <laughs> we, we'd, be, we'd be falling far behind. Far behind. Yeah. I'm waiting for... Uh, what's that? I'm, uh, I'm, wait I'm waiting on the ship right now. I got where stretched out. I'm dragging Atlanta around. Dan always likes these waiting moments because. Uh, Do we uh, want to continue <laughs> with introductions? Rye, are you on SPL? I can't even bring my head around to get a yes, zoom because we're so Hello, stretched out. Hello, everybody. My name's Rye Rolls the Wolf, and I am sitting in the Atlanta seat. I am an ROV oh, intern on this right. trip. This is my second time on the Nautilus. And when I'm not on here, I work for a Canadian company called Ocean Networks Canada that does oceanographic data. I'm down in the Her Her Hercules seat. Driving the bus. Oh, sounds good to me. Maybe I, I can back up a little towards you. Bridge, bridge, nav. Uh, let's do another 30 meters. Our, our vintage electronics. That's one of our interns says he came up here and spotted this box and he says, I love your vintage electronics. Slapping. <laughs> Okay, I'm back in the box. Where can I go now that I'm in my box? Yeah, if you go to the right, there should be some big features up. Yeah, but up I, I'd, I'd rather we we kind of head more towards the, you know the, the shortest route to intercept the track up. Yeah, that's what that's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, the I can't. we're having yeah, a little just, trouble swinging uh, uh, Atlanta over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the heading around the, he the heading around looks looks good, but just Atlanta let's not get too far to the west. Atlanta mm -hmm. sometimes has a mind of its own. It doesn't. No, it it doesn't swing uh, predictably like Argus. It just doesn't have the uh, doesn't have the weight or the mass. You know, it's really um, so. The lights are sweet there, but the bummer is, is if I turn off the down lights, which are the disruptors. Yeah, but. You see, okay, with them on, you see all the flock in the water and the Zeus blown out. With them off, it's like, boom, magic. Yeah, that's beautiful with the those lights off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it depends on that that dark spot on the bottom of the... Uh, sorry, I can go oh. off SPL if you yeah, want. Yeah, so this is a, a bamboo coral whip. And uh, what you can see here, it's interesting, we haven't really been able to see yet, is the bands that make uh, this an obvious bamboo coral. So these black bands these little black on the, black bands, yeah. Yeah, on the, um, the skeleton of the, the coral, they're protonaceous uh, bands. And um, I thought yesterday we saw some that were then occupied with some gold. Uh, yeah, uh, zoanthids. Zoanthids, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah.
All right, Dan, we're kind of centered up now. You can start following your back track. Yeah, follow your track back. I'll uh, do my best to keep up with you. Huh? We have a question about a coral from yeah, a little while that's back. That's a damn thing. Um, is the red around the coral fan the same part of the coral or a different animal? Oh yeah, there were different animals on there. So there's some brittle stars um, that you tend to see with primnoids, another association. Um, so yeah, brittle stars like to occupy coral fans because they, they can get up higher in the water column um, than they can physically climb with their arms. So they perch up high on that coral, they can feed, uh, have better potential to feed. It's really interesting comparing this dive where we're seeing so much coral at a much deeper depth than we did yesterday at such a shallow depth. Yeah, we're currently at uh, f uh, over 1,500 meters depth right now. Yesterday, was it like six? Yeah, we were between like six and, Yeah. I think we got up to like four, 400 yesterday. We had a really shallow dive yesterday. Yeah. So uh, for the back row, we're um, we're moving the ship in Atalanta at a constant speed down the previous track, but uh, Jonathan wants us to wander back and forth during that time to cover as much. Yeah, that, that, that's okay as long as we just keep moving uphill right. in in, in, in the long run. Down. The other uh, <laughs> Four zero two cool two feature five. we have here is as I'm wandering back and forth, I have the Norbit map in front of me, so mm -hmm. it's going to bias the uh, what you're seeing a little bit because we're where, uh, you know, the rocks are always more interesting, more... Uh, yeah, well, right now we're going through, uh, as we see on the Norbit map, we're going through this yeah. kind of rocky area, which is which is interesting. Um, but we'll, as, as we move up, we should get out of that and see what's on the flat. Yeah. So again, this large, large area of uh, old, old pillow flows. It's on these outcrops that we see the crinoids and the sponges. What what are those things we're seeing? Feather something? Yeah, so these are the Walteria sponges. So all of those fuzzy looking things are actually glass spicules. Wow. Uh, looks like we might be seeing a crinoid hanging off of one of them. Um, usually there are shrimp associated with them. Uh, they'll get actually trapped inside often for their life but it's still beneficial to them because they're protected and they can still also get food when the sponge filter feeds. Taylor Ann, what's a glass spicule, you said? Yeah, so these are actually glass sponges. So uh, earlier someone asked if these sponges, if you squished them, if they would be really, really soft, they would actually be crunchy. Um, and sometimes when we're retrieving these samples off of the ROV, if we collect a glass sponge, you have to be really careful not to poke yourself with the spicules. Um, That's incredible. Yeah, I, they're I, quite fascinating. Wow. And do they like do they exist in shallower depths as well, or just mostly deep sea? You know, I'm not too sure about that. I know more about the deep sea than I do uh, <laughs> shallow water sponges, but I don't I don't believe um, not not in this this way. No, they don't exist. Gotcha. That's insane. And there's a stalked red crinoid right there. A viewer thinks that they saw a squat lobster. Yeah, I think I saw that on one of the sponges. Yeah. Good eye. Looks like your track hooks to the south there on a crust. That's mm -hmm. correct, yeah. Right. Earlier, a viewer saying that they saw something that looked like an old potato. So we had popcorn and potatoes today. <laughs> I'm always down for a potato. <laughs> We had mashed potatoes for lunch. Yeah, mashed potato, potato wedges, yeah, french fries. Dan? Yes, sir. What would be the odds of you being able to stop and pick up one of those small rocks? 100%. 100%. I, I think that would be useful to do, to see. All right, that'll give me a chance to catch up, too. So. Yeah, we're, okay, good. we're still, uh, Atlanta's still being naughty and uh, going yep, Okay, like, good. Yeah, because I, I think it's it'll be important to see how manganese encrusted they are. Because this is a very different type of uh, 
How many environment uh, where there? How many millimeters do you get of manganese every million years? What, I forget what that number is. I cannot express how excited I am to see these rocks. <laughs> Yeah, it's is quite that fascinating. Is that, is that you or some comment that was made? No, 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 me. That's oh. like, <laughs> I am super excited. No, I, th I thought it was some <laughs> facetious comment being uh, no. <laughs> made over it. Yeah, it's quite fascinating to be in the presence of something millions and millions of years old. Yeah, from way down deep. on that. Thank you. Uh, actually, I don't need to it's do that. It's going to be a very large one, just just a, a nice representative one, one you can easily fit in your hand there. I always go for the bigger. So the geologists always tell us they want one with angles. I don't know if you're... Uh, and I'll poke one here and see if it's loose. That one's doable. Uh, too big for you, that'll fit in the box easy, easy money. Are you processing there? Or are you your name? What, Larry? What? I can't are hear you. you. Can uh, I poked this one, so the yep. geologists always want one with some hard angles, so that's a possibility there. It's loose. Yeah, that'd be fine. It's a little bigger than I thought, but... Uh, um, uh, if you can, if you think you can fit it, that'd be fine. I'm yeah, could we get lasers on also always, for uh, pictures? Yeah, can you uh, function the lasers? There? Mm, I don't see scale. Yeah, yeah, scale lasers, please. Uh, where are they? Where are they? Oh, there they are. Uh, there you go. Okay, so that's about. Four. Yeah. Uh, you can see where I scuffed it there. Let me give you a hint of what's under the manganese. <laughs> so, someone wants to know what uh, what does someone think about ferromanganese stuff? <laughs> He's excited. Yeah, uh, you can see the, all the all the. the, the the precipitation takes place on the bottom side that's exposed to the seafloor. What does uh, precipitation mean, Larry? Precipitation means uh, stuff that's coming out of the water, out of, out of the ground, the, the water that's circulating. Um, and that's where the minerals come from, from manganese nodules. The, um, they come precipitated. They, they are... It's Bridge, like when you get map. a salt crystal. When you evaporate the water, <laughs> you leave the, the salt. And so it's a, a similar sort of phenomena, though without the evaporation part. Um, that uh, certain Ryan, certain you, elements that are in excess camera, will, yeah, if they find a, to, um, an item to deposit on, will to starboard rail. accumulate. So right now, over SAT-3, we have the bucket that we're going to be putting the sample into. That's channel 3. Keep saying SAT-3. Uh, you all right if I put this in here with our uh, scoop, or you want it in a separate box? Well, I don't, um, if you could put it in a separate box, it would probably be best. Uh, uh, we have the marker in the other big box. Okay, then I don't think it'll hurt if it's in with the others. I don't know if it'll fit. I don't think there's any contamination that'll be done. Uh, I believe the marker is still in the forward box. So I might pin the marker with the rock. Uh, but we can, I can sort that out. But, uh, you're all right with it in with the nodules? Yeah, I think I think it'll be okay as long as it doesn't go crush them. You're not gonna crush them, are you? I'm uh, not sure it's gonna fit, so I might 
Mike. Uh, I'm going to have to put it in with the uh, marker. I think what I'm going to do is set it on top here Ridge, for a Ridge minute and get the marker nine, out. Zero. Or you can grab a smaller one too if that's easier, whatever's easier. Yeah, cancel this move and make that one instead. I think the marker's still in there. If anybody's wondering, that's the what we call the fiducial. That's a marker with of a known size that when Jonathan does his photogrammetry, we'll put in the frame, and that'll give him a, a reference, a size reference for all the other measurements. Yeah, because um, this expedition has mostly been about uh, 3D Im imaging and, and modeling, right? Not really collecting too much, um, too many samples, because somebody's asking about different bio boxes. Yeah, we had to remove the forward bio boxes mm -hmm. so that we can have the um, Triclops cameras there safely. Thank you. Excellent. Thank and that you. is sample number 003. Uh, you could close that box on the Herc Hydraulic page, would be great. Okay, and you all caught up with Atlanta? I would hope so. I haven't been paying attention. Atlanta's probably light years in front of us now. No, I'm trying to get you centered out. You're over to the side. Uh, Herc Hydraulics uh, sample tray in. Did you know it's still hanging out there? So you press that sample tray in button, it'll hit slow. Alright. 195, Dan. And you'll see the top squish down when it goes all the way in. That will seal it up so the dust will fly out of there. From all of our modules. Yes, thank you. And then you can switch uh, the camera back. One nine five. Yeah, that's wow. That's we're just under a meg, but yes, indeed it is. So Dan, we had a question back here from about whether you have a uh, haptic force feedback. Uh, on the manipulator arm, and either of the manipulator arms. We do have that capability with it, but um, we we don't use it. It is, uh, you know, it's like trying to hold an angry boa constrictor. Right? <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, need, you can come up now. Come up five. I should come. No, I'm going to come to the south of you there. I'm supposed to be coming at 195, but I'm going to get in front of you a little and then turn and burn. Yeah, there are uh, uh, several systems I've used the um, craft manipulator and the operators. Reach nav 25, uh, due south. Typically don't. I prefer not. to use the feedback. What would really be useful, um, and we have done, uh, did with the MIT kids, is to have audible feedback 
on the manipulator. So, and some of the manipulators that have a camera.